All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. It's really good to be with you. And um, so, of course, it's Shabbat today, and then tonight begins the Jewish holiday of Shavuot. And today we're going to take a look at Shavuot in anticipation of Shavuot. Um, there's a class of holidays called pilgrimage festivals. And these are called that because in ancient times, our Israelite ancestors, when they lived in the original nation of Israel, um, matters of religion were really controlled by a central authority, namely the priesthood that was based in Jerusalem. Now, like with all authority structures, you had people that supported those structures and people who found them inconvenient and didn't support those structures. So it, it's no surprise, for example, that people living in the north of Israel uh, didn't want to have to fully follow the rules of the Jerusalem central authority. Um, one of those rules were three times a year, uh, Israelites from around the country were expected to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to make sacrifices associated with three original biblical holidays, Sukkot, the festival of booths in the fall, Pesach, Passover in the spring, and Shavuot, known as the festival of weeks, because it occurs seven weeks after Passover. And that holiday celebrates both the early summer harvest of grain, as well as the historical overlay on that, uh, reminding us of receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai. So you have these three pilgrimage festivals. People came from far and wide. They'd come to Jerusalem. Uh, it created an economy there because these people would schlep in from far away um, and then they would have to buy an animal to sacrifice it, to fulfill their obligation. And so it created this interesting religio-economic arrangement around the centrality of the priesthood based in Jerusalem. And so today we have these three pilgrimage festivals. We're no longer burning animals and uh, engaging in animal sacrifice, but we have remnants of those three festivals and what's evolved over time into how we observe them today. So that, that's the first thing I wanna say just by way of introduction. The second thing is, in terms of uh, Jewish holidays, these three festivals in particular, they all have at their heart an agricultural dimension. So Sukkot is about harvest, uh, Pesach is about planting, and um, grain harvest, early summer grain is with Shavuot. In the course of time, other layers of meaning were overlaid on those original cosmic agriculturally rooted events. So for example, Sukkot is associated with the Exodus from Egypt because the temporary booths, the sukkah, uh, may have very well been similar to what the Israelites lived in when they first went out into the desert after the Exodus uh, from Egyptian bondage. Pesach obviously associated with the Passover story, which we tell every year in the Haggadah. And Shavuot, as I said, the overlay is the Israelites eventually arrive at Mount Sinai and they have this experience. And that's what we're going to focus on today. What was the nature of that experience? Whoops, wrong thing. There we go. Um, hold on. What was the nature of that experience? So to start this, hold on, let's get this all ready. And we'll go to 
that view. And here we go. From the burning bush, O oh Lord, you charged me to bring the people to this holy mountain to behold your glory and receive your law. What have I left undone? Whoops, my bad. Hold on, start again, there we go. You get to see it again, I'm sorry. From the burning bush, O oh Lord, you charged me to bring the people to this holy mountain to behold your glory and receive your law. What have I left undone? Here we go. Right. So I'm sure you all recognize this. This is from Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments. And understand that when we talk about Shavuot, this holiday really focuses on this scene, this exact scene that Cecil B. DeMille attempts to depict what is described in the Torah. What we're gonna do this morning, uh, among other things, is we've seen DeMille's presentation of this. Um, we're gonna look at actually what the Torah said actually happened. Uh, and it'd be good to compare the two. Um, the only glaring error in this particular rendition of this encounter um, is the 10 commandments do not say thou shalt not kill. 
that is a complete mistranslation. It says, thou shalt not murder, is what the Hebrew says. And it's important that there's an understanding of that. So before we go on, well, what do you think of DeMille's version of this encounter? I, I'll admit to you, uh, I still kind of get goosebumps when I watch it. <laughs> when I, and I watch it like once a year, like around Shavuot. <laughs> Or, or if the movie's on TV around uh, Easter, it's usually on TV. Any any reactions to this? <laughs> that that movie defined um, our people for me when I was very young and living in Raton, New Mexico, and the only Jewish family there. Um, I mean, this this was sort of the definition of what happened to our people. Yep. Be, be it so flagrantly wrong in so many respects, it's still, and I think when I talk to people, I, I talk about the Ten Commandments to non-Jews, and of course that defines what everyone sort of believes the, the Exodus to be, I think. Oh, for sure. For, in fact, for a lot of non-Jews, um, the only part of the so-called Old Testament that they remember is this, the giving of the Ten Commandments, with very little. And some remember Abraham, um, but don't know much, really much about Abraham's character or story. So yes, it is very much defining. Anyone else? Come on. <laughs> Well, then let's let's move on. And um, the next thing I want to show you is um, the idea of Mount Sinai is central for traditional Jews who understand that at that moment in time, the halacha, halacha is a Hebrew word meaning the way, from holech to walk, halacha that the laws, if you will, the way of traditional Judaism, all of it was revealed on Mount Sinai. Not simply the Ten Commandments, um, but everything was revealed. Um, and for traditional Jews, in some ways, Shavuot is among the most important holidays because of its celebration of Sinai. There's an idea that I, I think I've presented a, one other time <coughs> to this group to explain the orthodox perspective. And this concept could be applied to any religious civilization, in fact, uh, as a, a view of a religion's history. So, you know, you can look at history and interpret it in different ways as a whole. And we have an interpretation of history that's described in the Talmud. And it is stated as Hil da da rut ha do rot. Hil da da rut ha do rot. Can you see it written right there? And it means the degeneration of the generations since Sinai. And it's based on the pivotal nature of this original and pristine encounter between Hashem and the people of Israel. And so halacha, the way, is in one sense, the way back to Sinai. Because by following Jewish law and following it to the letter will lead you to the pure form of our religion. And there is this belief that the purest form of our religion is that which goes back to Sinai and this moment that Cecil B. DeMille tried to depict. <clears throat> and so the further we travel in time away from the Sinaitic moment, what the tradition calls the moment of 
Torah mi Sinai, Torah coming from Sinai. The further in time we travel away, the more our religion, our faith degenerates. So Sinai represents in traditional Judaism an all-encompassing, timeless, cross-generational, single moment of revelation that miraculously revealed all prophecy for all time. Uh, or what some would say, all Torah with a small T, not just the five books with a large T, Torah, not just the 10 commandments, but 613 commandments, all Jewish prophecy, all Jewish knowledge, all Torah in the generic sense of the word Torah, Torah meaning Jewish knowledge, all Jewish knowledge was revealed in what we just saw in that little depiction. And um, I wanna put that out there because every religious civilization, excuse me, I apologize. Every religion could be understood to have a group of believers who look at their own historical narrative, their own historical mythology, their own historical sense of what's miraculous and have the same idea. The idea of being able to cross time and go back to original first encounters. We can apply this very clearly. It's very much in a sense at the heart of Christianity and communion. Because when a Christian engages in a communion, they are crossing time and going back in time in a sense to the passion of Jesus um, and to the Last Supper. And to take these pivotal, mystical, so-called miraculous events and through ritual, be able to go back in time and connect with those events. And so this idea of the degeneration of generations, the idea that history is in decline, you know, everything's about reclaiming the pristine past. It's kind of like about turning the clock back. And, you know, in the world, just in general, it, the simplistic way of describing this is the constant, sometimes uncomfortable, painful tension between tradition and change and holding on to this ancient archetype. In our case, the Sinai encounter. <coughs> And in a sense, because we're holding on to that archetype, we're resistant to change, resistant in a sense to change or even embrace sometimes future ideas. And so that's why you find in Orthodox communities, people become cloistered against the changing world. So I feel like that Shavuot and this recognition of these types of encounters is really important for us as Jews. Although of the three pilgrimage festivals, this gets the least amount of attention. But in some ways, one might consider it among the most important of the holidays because what it does is it challenges every single Jewish person to ask themselves, what does encountering God mean to me. So just a couple of working terms going a little further down the page. The term theophany. It's a good word to know. Theophany 
is a visible manifestation of a deity usually associated with an encounter of some kind. <coughs> For the ancient Israelites, the theophany was right here on Sinai. But there are other examples of theophany where God became manifested in a way that the people knew about it. Can you think of other examples of that? <laughs> What's the original theophany for Moses? You do know this. Burning bush. Burning bush. Burning bush. bush. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Burning bush is a theophany. Yes. Okay. Um, can you think of other examples of God becoming present in a kind of encounter? Like the parting of the Red Sea? Yes. I mean, yeah. God traveling with a pillar of fire and smoke through the desert. Can you think of others? Jacob's ladder. Yes. Jacob seeing the angel and uh, and um, Isaac and Abraham at um, uh, you know at the potential slaying of yep. uh, Isaac. Yep. These are all kind of examples of theophany, uh, where there's an aspect or something um, that catches our attention. And then we come to realize it's an expression of the divine. Do you remember what Moses said when he first notices the burning bush? He says something to the effect of, oh, look at that. That's a strange thing. I need to take a closer look. Mm -hmm. And then we have the encounter. So Sinai is supposed to be the pivotal archetypical encounter in our historical narrative. And there are these many moments of theophany. Now, I don't know, maybe some of us here have had experiences like that, you know, where maybe we thought God was speaking with us. You know, it's hard to talk about those kinds of things in the modern world because people automatically think either you've lost it or that you're a fundamentalist creep. And that's why I like to leave theophany associated with historical encounters. But there is another type of encounter that we all know about. And I have used the term, these are called God moments. And I think we all, hopefully we all, have had God moments in our lives. At moments, uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel uh, tried to describe these. Listening to the a term, lecture. Uh, using the term radical amazement. So we have these experiences of, ra like of awe, radical amazement. Um, Heschel referred to this kind of associated as when we have that incredible awe moment, something so awesome, we, we are so in the minute, in the moment of the experience, we're not thinking about the experience, we're not describing the experience, it is so awe-inspiring and captivating, and in the moment we're in there, in that space, that's a God moment. <clears throat> and these are different kinds of encounters than a theophany. There are moments of awe, experiences of the divine that are very personal to our own human experience. And I imagine, if, let's do this right now just for a minute. If anyone wants to share actually a God moment that they've experienced. And the thing is, oh, well, you, I know how people think about this. Oh, it, it's trivial. 
you know, when my baby was born, you know, like as if these are just normal things in life, but it's, we're not talking about what's normal or not. We're talking about what you experienced. Unfiltered. Where you were so awestruck. And then when you came out of that awestruck place, you went, hmm. I think, I think that had to do with God. I don't know how or why, but that's what it felt like. Yeah. A couple of experiences. Good. One is I had in New York City visit <laughs> a woman in a nursing home and became friends with her and no one was visiting her. And there came a time when she needed to be buried. She had a grave, but she didn't remember where it was. And the people assured her she would be properly buried, the, the staff, but they didn't know where it was. Well, at one point I looked in her address book and I called a place and they said, no, we don't have a grave for her. And I said, and I prayed to God. I said, if you don't help me, this woman's going to be end up being in a public place. Mm -hmm. Well, then they came, they, I said, please look again. They looked again and they found a group grave where her mother was buried and which was her burial place. A lot of other things happened in relation to that. But the end of the story is that finally, when it came time to bury her, I buried her with a Chabad rabbi. And when I came home uh, that night, I felt like my room at a certain point was filled with light and I was filled with light and I had an experience like, what is this? And I almost got scared because it felt like something was penetrating me that I was not familiar with. And I, I kind of got scared and then it was over. Uh, but it was like, oh my God, what happened here? So that that was one thing. Um, and at another time, I visited the Lubavitcher Rebbe's grave in Queens, New York. And uh, I guess the previous Rebbe was also buried there. And I was at a point where I was saying, what kind of work should I be doing? I don't know. And I just prayed, what should I be doing? And I, this has never happened before. I heard a voice that said, teach Yiddishkeit to children. And I had no idea what that meant. I didn't even know what the word Yiddishkeit meant. I, subsequently, I visited a rabbi and asked, but it wasn't my voice. It wasn't anything of my own thinking. And I can't explain that. Great examples. And I'm so happy you've had those experiences. Yes, but sometimes afterwards, you kind of wish that they would sustain you for longer. And because I haven't felt anything like that in quite a long time. And I kind of would like it. Yeah. Wow, thank you, Lynn. Yeah, thank you very much for that. You know, I think we, you know, we would all I shouldn't say that. I'm sure many like you want to have a, a more ongoing awareness of the divine but I think that part of what defines being human uh, has to do with the very fact that we can't do that. That if we were capable, uh, and I suppose, you know, there are all kinds of spiritual disciplines in the world, you know, particularly around mysticism and meditation and things that where, where people actively and in a very structured way try to change the focus of their, you know, the light in their mind. Um, 
But I think the human brain is designed, the human person is designed in such a way that while we can evoke those experiences, we can't be in that state all the time. Um, and I have a theory about why that is. And it's the same theory in Jewish tradition that explains why humans require sleep. And think about that. I mean, humans require, I mean, most sentient creatures require sleep, but humans in particular really require sleep in a cyclical, you know, cyclical way, or eventually the mind and the body will not function properly. In Jewish tradition, I once read this commentary that said the reason human beings are designed to sleep is because it's God's insurance that humans will not be ultimately arrogant because we're forced to shut down. And that's part of what makes artificial intelligence such a scary phenomenon, really, or robotics, or, you know, as we grew up with androids on Star Trek uh, and other places, that androids don't, in theory, don't need to sleep. And artificial intelligence doesn't sleep. And, you know, that's kind of an unbridled power. And sleep prevents humans from complete unbridled power. I mean, even the worst dictators, the worst of the worst of the worst, still were forced to sleep. Not that it made them any more humble. It, it surely didn't in so many cases. So in some ways, the fact that we were forced to sleep to limit our power, I think is connected to why we can't be in a state of noumenal awareness 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because I hate to use this silly kind of uh, um, term, but it would go to our heads and it would make us crazy arrogant and it could motivate us if we had that, like we think you have God in your pocket because I can walk around in the state of spiritual nirvana all day long. <clears throat> but I do think there are a lot of different paths out there in this world that can help us evoke temporary connections to that. Um, and you all know this, I'm of the mind that there's not just one proper superior methodology to make those connections. It, it just makes no sense to me that there would be just one. The third <coughs> terminology versus theophany, God moments, is this God concepts. <coughs> and God concepts are when we try to analyze the divine. We talk about the divine. When I say, I think God is compassionate. I'm developing a concept about God as opposed to having an, an experience of a God moment. Um, and so here you have these three things. You have theophany, which are these historically transforming encounters. We have God moments, which we can all access intermittently if we try. Um, and then we have God concepts, um, which is, you know, when we talk about the difference between Judaism and Christianity's understanding of God. Now, I want you to keep that in mind because we're now going to read a section from the Torah that actually describes from the Torah's point of view what happened on Mount Sinai. And um, we'll see what you think about that. And since we're now going to study the Torah text, 
we can say the blessing up here at the top. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam, asher kitshanu b'mitzvotav, v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who house us with mitzvot, commanding us to engage with words of Torah. So here, this is from Exodus chapter 20. And we're going to do it in English, just with this little section. Someone want to read line, line 15. It's very small. I don't know if you're able to enlarge it. It's hard for us to see. So let me see. I, I think I can, actually. That's actually better. There you go. How about that? That's much better. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Oops. No, go down. That's you said 15? Yeah, there we go. So who wants to start? Um, this is Leslie, I'll start. Okay, thank you. All the people saw, perceived the voices, thunder and lightning the voice of the shofar and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they fell back and stood at a distance. All right, so we'll just start with that. So um, the people, it's interesting. The Hebrew can mean they literally saw it or they experienced it as a vision. <clears throat> and we don't know for sure. All we, you know, whether they actually like saw these things happening or whether it was in their minds, we don't know. But what we do know is they perceived, they had a perception uh, of thunder and lightning. And then the voice of the shofar. So it tells us also there were people, this is a really important little detail that while this is going on, when they're at the base of the mountain, right? And God had already said to them, to Moses, bring the people close so I can present myself, God says. The voices of the shofar are in a way, the reality check of what was going on for these people. Like this wasn't like they were in a dream. They could hear shofar blasts being made by other members of the community. Uh, like, almost like a recognition, like, wow, through the sounds of the shofar. So on the one hand, they have this thing happening in front of them that's about to unfold. And at the same time, they hear the earthly sounds of the shofar and they see the mountain smoking and it said and when the people saw it they fell back and stood at a distance what does that tell you i just find it so interesting because people say oh i would give anything to talk to god i'd love to talk to god just give me my moment i want my moment i want to ask my questions i want to have my I got something to say to you, you know, and hear what happens. God appears. And what do they do? They fall back and stand at a distance. Yeah. Scared. Completely scared. Completely scared. And then not only are they scared, what happens? Line 16. <laughs> they asked Moses to be an intercessor. Yeah, they they fall back and then they say, you speak to us, Moses, uh, and we will obey. But we don't, don't let Hashem speak to us lest we die. Which again, I find truly fascinating and, and interesting. Um, again, it, it's expressing the part of a conversation about God <coughs> that we often don't have. And that is the ambivalence, the natural ambivalence 
one might feel if actually someone, you know, knocked on you. Look, if someone knocked on my door, said, um, Rob, the president of the United States would like to meet you tomorrow. <laughs> he wants to talk to you about the future of the Jewish people. <laughs> of course, it's not going to happen. But if it were to happen, how would that make me feel? I would be excited, but I'd also be a little ambivalent. I'd want to make sure I got a good haircut. I'd go out and buy a new suit, I, you know, whatever. I would prepare. I'd get all, you know, whatever. But I'd also like, my heart would be beating a little faster because I'm going to go meet the most powerful person in the world. So what if it was God knocking on your door and said, hey, <laughs> I'll be in the town square in an hour. I want you to come meet with me. And you know what the rabbi said about that? You're busy out in your garden and you're planting and someone runs down the street and says, hey, the Messiah is going to be in the town square in 10 minutes. The rabbi said, keep planting. Keep planting. So again, that ambivalence, uh, which I, and I think this captures something so authentic. Um, so verse 17, someone would read that, please. Moshe answered the people, be not afraid. For Hashem has come only in order to test you and in order that the awe of him may be ever with you so that you do not stray, go astray. Yeah. So now talk now. The, let's just take a second and understand that in line 15, it's kind of shaping up to be a theophany of historic magnitude. In line 16, they're like, thanks, but no thanks. In line 17, we now get a God concept. So Moses says, be not afraid. Okay. I'll tira'u, but why? For Hashem has come only in order to test you. <laughs> really? Seriously? I got enough source in my life already. You know, I get tested every minute of my waking life. So now the first time I get to meet God, it's like, oh, don't be afraid. He's just going to, he's going to be the strictest teacher you've ever met. He's going to give you a test like you've never seen. And I'm like, Oh, hooray, happy day. You know, that's a theological statement right there. That God is encountering the Jewish people and it's telling us something. It's conditional. Because a test is a condition. It is a form of a condition. And why is God going to test us? In order that the awe of God <laughs> may ever be with you, so you do not go astray. Would someone like to sum up this as a theological statement? Well, that you need to be afraid of God, God's power. Or God. <laughs> well, it says be not afraid. I know, but, but it's also saying be in awe of him so that you don't go astray. So you're supposed to still fear God. Well, it depends what we mean by awe. Yeah. So Hashem, Hashem is a God that is involved in this world in which God tests us. And the purpose of these tests is to teach us to have awe for God. And that that awe is so important, uh, it'll keep you from going astray. That's pretty much like an equation. <coughs> it, it's saying 
accept the commandments and do it with awe for the commander. And if you do that, you won't go astray. But Rabbi, it yeah. was it, it was so unrealistic because the the Jewish people, the Israelites, chafed under the uh, uh, Egyptian uh, domination. And now they're being asked to trade that domination for a domination by a being that they can't see, exactly. don't want to personally talk to. And the rules that they're getting are not really from God, they're from Moses. And so now they're, they're servants all over again. And that's why they chafe so much in the desert. They crab about everything and they, they contest God rules all the time in the desert because they don't they don't want to submit to some authority that's going to tell them how to live that's that's that was the same problem they had in egypt beautifully said charles and it's absolutely true um so the midrash tries to give a little more insight into what the people were experiencing because again that's what we're looking at on Shavuot what happened in that encounter <clears throat> and let's face it Charles that <clears throat> when Moses goes to Pharaoh and says to Pharaoh uh, let my people go it's not just that it's let my people go so that they may worship me or they may serve me. And so they go, as you say, from the service of the Pharaoh to the service of Yahweh. And of course, what flows out is soon they don't have food. They say, we'd rather have the flesh pots of Egypt. Soon they don't have water. You know, they want to beat up on Moses. Um, God provides in all those cases. <clears throat> but even after God providing, the people still, right through the entire Torah, remain basically skeptical, resistant. <clears throat> so we have a, um, a midrash from a, a section of midrash called Exodus Rabba, would someone like to read this, please? The Torah was given. The Torah was given through seven voices. The people saw the master of the universe revealed in every one of these voices. Right, let's stop that's with that. Hold on. Let's okay. just take that. So <laughs> that's very interesting. So anyone think of another reference to the number seven that's connected to God in the Midrash? and in Kabbalah. We have a reference to what's called the seven heavens. And because there is this notion that God's manifestation, it has multiple manifestations, at least manifested in seven different realms. And so each realm is a form of expression of God. And so here they're saying, the Torah was given through seven voices. So when it was given on Sinai, there were seven simultaneous voices speaking, uh, unlike Cecil B. DeMille's one voice. By the way, you know, it is Cecil B. DeMille's voice who is the voice of God in the film, by the way. Just a piece of trivia. So, the, and then it says, the people saw the master of the universe revealed in every one of these voices. And I love this because when you go back to the idea of a God moment, we are all experiencing those moments through our own voices, through our own experience, through our own heart, through our own mind. It's so private, it's so subjective. And so the idea that God speaks in many voices, I think is a great meaning. It means God is able to speak to all of us as individuals. So go ahead. 
That's the meaning of the verse, Exodus 20, 15. All the people saw the voices. Right, it's that weird construct, which I we read up above. They saw or they perceived. Keep going. Okay, I'll comment on that in a bit. <clears throat> It's these voices were accompanied by sparks of fire and flashes of lightning that were in the shape of the letters of the Ten Commandments. They saw the fiery word pouring out from the mouth of the Almighty and watched as they were inscribed on the stone tablets. As it says, the voice of God inscribes flames of fire. Psalm 29, 4. And when the people actually saw the one who speaks the world into being, note Abarakadabra, they fainted away. Some say that their spirits left their bodies, while others say that they entered a prophetic trance. These visions brought them to trembling and shaking and a blackout of the senses. Midrash Exodus Rabbah. I couldn't, I can't hear you, Rabbi. I would bet that Cecil B. DeMille, uh, when the film was being developed, had rabbinic and Jewish scholarly advisors. Um, and I would bet that phrase here, the voice of God inscribes flames of fire, may have helped inform how he envisioned that little scene that we watched at the beginning. Um, you all know about abracadabra from uh, magic, abracadabra. It's actually a Hebrew word, abracadabra, and it comes from Jewish mysticism, from Kabbalah. And it means abara, that uh, means I will create, kadabara, as I speak. The notion creation took place by God speaking, let there be light, let there be. So by speech, existence came to be. And so there is this reference here uh, that is through speech, once again, that God creates, God is known. That's why we talk about in Judaism, we have a lot of reference to hearing God's voice as opposed to seeing God. Think about our prayer, Shema, Yisrael, hear, hearken. <coughs> Any comments about the Midrash? Okay. I, just want to say, I just want to say, to me, this is really interesting. Uh, example of synesthesia, sensory blending, which happens in deep prayer. It happens in uh, uh, you know, mystical um, encounters. Um, with the divine there, that you don't you 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 see voice you um you know hear color and this is an example of how a blending of human senses is happening in order to understand what is going on because we are in fact we're limited in our ability to completely perceive but this kind of synesthesia happens and that's that i i didn't know this Josh, and i love it just love it. Um, uh, it actually, you know, may or may not be related, but it is worth noting. Um, oh, this is a while ago. It's probably about eight or nine years ago. I was I was approached. I was in Pennsylvania at that time, and I was approached through some other clergy that I know, and I was invited to apply to be part of a research study um, that was, I don't remember if it was NYU or Johns Hopkins, because one of the two. And um, it was, they wanted to study the effects of hallucinogens, particularly on clergy, on people who live a full-time spiritual life. Uh, so, <laughs> hey, I'm 66. I can say whatever I want now. I was not accepted into the program um, because I had actually tried a hallucinogen once when I was young. And the only people that could be in that program 
where people had never ever used a hallucinogenic drug. So, um, but I will, you know, we know there's a lot of um, spiritual practice that also can include hallucinogenic um, substances, certainly peyote and other things we know about, or read the, the teachings of Don Juan or anything like that. And you'll have people describe things like this. This says, what's the term you used? the merging of different senses. Oh, it's synesthesia. Synesthesia. Yeah. Synesthesia. Um, so, you know, there, there, it's interesting. There may be psychic caps, if you will, that will limit um, certain functions of the higher frontal cortex. And when, and I'm not promoting using hallucinogenic drugs, so don't take it this way. But um, I know they're doing pretty remarkable research now on its impact on recalcitrant depression, uh, people with terminal illness, um, with um, sometimes untreatable anxiety, and they've used these substances um, and it breaks through some of the ca these caps, if you will, and it, it allows them for whatever reason, of course, they're still researching, to, um, to release whatever the psychic stressors are as a result of those kinds of experiences. Um, it's, and it's very interesting, if you, you go to the very end of the Midrash, it, these visions brought them to trembling and shaking and a blackout of the senses. And I think, again, it's fascinating, and uh, just in general, of how as humans, we don't even fully understand our own psychic capacity. And so this particular midrash and this story of this encounter, <clears throat> I think part of the reason it's captured the imagination of millennia of people, of all the world, really all the world's major religions is because it's, it represents an expansion of consciousness on some level. And uh, I don't know, I just think it's really cool. So the question was, how does this description of the encounter with Hashem resonate with your own experience? So I don't know, has anyone ever had an experience akin to this? <clears throat> well, yeah. Have, yeah go ahead um i i for me like i see colors like i see patterns shapes colors and i don't know how to describe it but when do you see them um Usually it's sort of a half awake, half, con you know, not quite awake, not sleeping, but somewhere in between state. Okay. Yeah. And it's usually um, like they're incredibly beautiful. And like, I wish I had the artistic talent to paint them or something. And they're always different. They're always unique. Wow. Um, <coughs> I don't really understand what they mean, you know, like they don't correspond to direct do, meaning that I can tell. How do, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> how do they make you feel? Um, I mean, it's definitely a positive, okay. very positive, like, you know, beautiful, peaceful kind of a thing. Well, I've had a similar experience, um, not in many years, but <clears throat> back in my late twenties, um, I went through a, at the time, seemed like a traumatic experience. <clears throat> and I went to sleep during this period and 
I was not fully asleep, but what I saw in the dark, um, the only thing I can compare it to is, you know, in the Wizard of Oz, when the good witch flies in in a little ball, and then she appears, <coughs> the little pink ball. I had this experience like there was this little kind of ball, spiritual ball, and it was a beautiful color. It was kind of pinkish and purple, and, <coughs> and it came into my bedroom, and I completely, my whole body relaxed. Oh, wow. And I had this sense. It wasn't like I heard a voice. It was like I saw a voice that said, it's going to be okay. Hmm. And then it just, and as quickly as it happened, I think it was no more than five or 10 seconds. It was gone. That's really neat. Hmm. Any other experiences? Okay. Yeah, you, I, do you want? Do, I think Neil. Did you want to say something? Come on, hang on. Well, well, yeah, I just uh, in '97, my brother had cancer, and um, you know, even though I was both brought up, you know, fully Jewish, I was never that spiritual. Uh, never believed deeply in prayer personally. And I think my brother was kind of in the same mindset. Um, anyway, uh, in the beginning of his uh, procedures with chemo, radiation, everything, I said, well, how do you know it's going to work? And he says, well, basically, if it kills all the bad cells, the cancer cells, without killing me. And um, so it's got to be kind of right on the cusp. Um, he was a... I don't want to get too far into it, but he was 15th human being after animal testing for this when T cells were first mm. brought into human use. Um, and he had a peripheral stem cell transplant, which was very, very, very new then. Wow. Um, anyway, uh, he was at a point, my sister and I were doing six hours on, six hours off shifts. And to be by his side, take care of him, and, and his kind of requirement. He was at, up in Seattle to Fred Hutchinson Center. Anyway, at one point, uh, I was getting off my shift at midnight. She was there. And I remember telling Twyla, I just don't know. I just don't have a good feeling right now. I just, um, I'm just not sure he's going to make it. And I stayed there a little longer. And she says, you know, you, you go get your rest so you can come back six in the morning. So uh, it's like one of the first times I've ever been to a chapel to, to pray. And I did. And, uh, you know, kind of broke down and asked, you know, I was trying to talk to God. And, uh, you know, I went home. I think I got a few hours of sleep, came back at six. And he, his eyes were literally open. And at the time, while I was in the chapel, my sister-in-law, Twyla, felt that he was leaving. He was dying. And uh, I mean, she's a nurse. She's very, you know, experienced. She knew what she was doing medically. He said she got on top of him, top of the bed, and started beating on his chest and said, don't you leave me. And said all these names, you know, whatever. She was very, you know, distraught about it. And uh, anyway. When I came back in the morning, his eyes were open. He was able to speak a little bit. And later, a few days later, he spoke about the fact that he remembered at that moment that he saw um, he saw that light that people talk about. And he was drawn by it. He said it was beautiful. He really wanted to go there. But somewhere there was a voice that uh, he had heard that uh, 
you know, not quite yet. You'll be here at some point, but, uh, you know, your job is just not done, not completely done. So, anyway, we had him for another 20 years, and it was wonderful, and uh, it was great. So, anyway, that was kind of my... Wow. Life. Wow. Yeah. Wow. There's something there. There's something there, and you know, there. Talk about examples. We mentioned the burning bush. Completely non-rational. We talk about the Shekhinah, a feminine presence mm -hmm. of God. There's the term you've heard: still small voice. Where we have an inner awareness. Um, and notice the language we Jews use. Hashem, meaning the name. Hamakom, meaning the place. Or we talk about the ineffable name. <coughs> and we've talked about this before, that Judaism, you know, is very committed to maintaining the sacred mystery of God. And the reason I mention that is that people often say, well, if there's a God, why is, doesn't God speak anymore? Oh, God does speak still. So. What? God still speaks. <coughs> Maybe but we just not, not, but I what I'm saying is, but not like on Sinai. So the, one of the questions I want to ask you. Yeah. And what's uh, the answer to that? What's the answer to? Why doesn't God speak anymore like that? So that we are reassured of God's presence. I don't know the answer to that. Um, But I've, I always personally go back to the book of Esther, <coughs> which almost was not included in the Hebrew Bible because God is, isn't even mentioned in the book of Esther. Um, and you know the simplest explanation around that is it's to illustrate that even if God is not overt doesn't mean God doesn't exist or God isn't speaking through others, perhaps. So <coughs> there are some in the traditional Jewish community that would answer the question by saying, God doesn't speak anymore now in the same way God did in ancient times, because everything God needed to say has already been said. It's all there. Just open your Torah and study it. Open your Talmud and study it. And you can be steeped in God's word 24 seven for the rest of your life and you'll never finish. Uh, this and is what it, this, what it does is it illustrates again it's a, kind of a hard concept that this moment right now has this potential power and meaning as the sinai moment had back then the difference is what are we going to do to try to capture that sinai moment in our own experience now I don't know what people would, I mean, really, if people were walking around the world and all of a sudden there was like the whole world heard a voice coming from the sky. I don't know. It's like, is that, that's what we read about in scripture, but is that really what people want? I don't know. I don't know. I guess I'll just ask Rabbi, maybe the point of God not speaking anymore 
but is he not also not speaking any less? I mean, is he speaking, you know, the population was smaller. Israel was the center of, you know, part of the center of, of, of you know, the beginning. And is he still speaking, but fewer people are hearing him um, at one time? I don't know. So, perfect comment, really, for this next point about something in rabbinic commentary. And so the question is asked in the form of a rhetorical statement. <coughs> As you said, we don't hear God anymore and also not any less. And look at what they wrote. It is possible that at Sinai, we heard nothing from the mouth of God other than the letter Aleph. Of the first word God said, and that is the first word of the Ten Commandments. <coughs> and the word is Anochi, Anochi, Anochi Adonai Elohecha, I am Yahweh, your God. <coughs> Don't forget the Midrash that teaches that the Aleph and the Bet were having an argument. The first two letters about which letters should be the first letter of the Torah. Do you remember this? Yeah, the Aleph and the Bet argued who should be first. <coughs> God chose to begin with the Bet because the Bet is shaped so that you can only move forward into the future. The bounded heaven, the bounded earth, and the bounded past. The letter bet, we go forward. God said, but I'm saving the Aleph for something even more important. And that's to be this letter right here in the first letter of my name. <coughs> Anochi. As we read in Exodus 2015, and all the people saw the thunder, which we looked at, and they answer, in other words, they saw what is normally heard. They saw what is normally heard. At Sinai in silence, we saw the letter Aleph, according to this commentator, evoking the name and presence of God. So actually, I this I kind of think this is kind of cool, really, that when they were at Sinai, they didn't really hear in any anything. But up in the sky, there was like a giant olive floating around, you know, like I, I think of like, you know, those airplanes that the airplane messengers, messages, you know, skywriters, skywriters. So God was like this really advanced, cool skywriter and like wrote a big giant olive up in the sky above the mountain. And this guy, Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Horowitz from the 19th century, he said, yeah, it, it, to your point, Neil. God said a lot less than we think. In fact, all God did was put out the olive. So then I'm going to ask this question. We're going to go on just for a few more minutes. Interesting that in Judaism, encountering Hash Hashem is most often in terms of hearing. Uh, like Shema, when human nature suggests seeing is believing. Uh, might Rabbi Horowitz be suggesting that seeing is hearing? Uh, and what could this mean? And might he also be suggesting that silence is a necessary part of the equation? <laughs> in encountering Hashem. Or in order to really perceive the divine, we have to start with silence. It's an interesting idea. <coughs> Any thoughts about that? Yeah, um, I think for me, 
it's like yes and i think all of those are true i think that i think it does have to begin with silence and i think that people can experience god through all those ways for some people it's more seeing for some people it's more hearing for some people it's feeling and experiencing or knowing i think all of them are true it's interesting this little midrash right here is one of my favorites <coughs> and i've actually included it in the in a book that i'm writing about birds in fact and um, it says, said Rabbi Abayu, in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, when the Holy One gave the Torah, no bird screeched, no fowl flew, no ox mooed, none of the Ophanim angels flapped the wing, nor did the seraphim burning celestial beings chant, kadosh, 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 holy, holy, holy. The sea did not roar, and none of the creatures uttered a sound. Throughout the entire world, there was only a deafening silence as the divine voice went forth speaking, Anochi, Adonai Elecha, I am the Lord your God. Any reaction to that? No? Rabbi, I couldn't, I, I am having problem with my mute button there. Um, when you, when we, I guess I should say, commune um, in deep prayer, I mean, there is a sense that we are internalizing our senses and that it's in complete silence that we begin to communicate. I know that from personal experience. So it makes sense to me that to hear the <coughs> voice of Hashem, that there has to be silence because now we're communicating from that inner sense of speech inner sense of sight inner knowing and for that you can't expect it to be voiced the way human senses or seen the way human senses perceive i guess i'm going back to that you know old uh, sort of um sense of and it's not just in judaism but communing through your third eye communing through the uh yeah um your uh, inner voice, inner sight, you know, in, in the prayer. I guess that's my comment on that. Mm -hmm. you, you said quite a bit right there. Um, <clears throat> that's I'm, I'm taking in what you said, and I'm thinking about <clears throat> what is it that goes into the shift of consciousness um, where you are more attuned mm. to the spiritual nature of everything. Yeah. <clears throat> I do, and I brought it up before, but there have been lots of theological attempts to describe what is that shift of spiritual space. Um, what is the difference between the holy and the profane? <coughs> Shabbat and the rest of the week, the Jewish people and other nations. Um, what do we, when we say holy means set apart for a special purpose and if you can walk through life seeing everybody and everything in terms of sacred qualities um i thought at least in my life experience the most brilliant uh, although not easily readable 
description of that is Martin Buber's I am that. And <clears throat> because he, he, he gives us an insight into going through life and seeing everyone and everything in terms of their utility on the one hand. What can you do for me? That tree, how much wood will it give me? How much shade will it give me? It's always about utility. And he says, that's when we think of the world as an it. But there are different ways to look at, let's just take a tree, for example. What are some ways you can look at a tree that are in respect of its inherent holiness? Now, the opposite of that is I can get 10 planks of wood to build a house from that tree. Or I can plant that tree and it'll give me some shade. So what's the opposite of that? Yep. Well, well, when when I mean, <coughs> tree of life. I mean, but I just want to uh, look at a tree in terms of how incredible the roots are so deep, and how incredible that it has managed to take its place, you know, in space time dimension, with that kind of on that kind of difficult earth. So I, I, I look at the wonder of the roots, and then it is not only reaching down to the earth, but reaching up to the sky, what a great connector, and a reminder of that connection a tree is. And yet, there's also the fact that trees are correct connected through their root systems and what an incredible message it is that we can be solitary but know to, that we are in communication and connection with others of our you know sensory capacities and and and, and divine intelligence i mean there's so many different ways of looking at that tree and uh, loving it for its life, its life force. And the fact that, well, here, maybe it, there's the hippie side coming out, but touching a tree, you can hear the sap flow if you listen. And what a good reminder it is that, you know, life flows and that is the flow of life. You can hear the flow of life when you listen to a tree. I mean, these are some of the ways in which I can think of a tree. Um, in a holy kind of, um, you know, perspective. Small area. Wonderful. Anyone else? No why area. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is, but I always have a thing for old trees, and and I look at them and think, what what have they witnessed over so many years? And yeah. what storm? What storms? Ferocious storms did they survive? And <clears throat> although I think it's defacing a tree to carve a heart into a tree, as people used to do. I don't know if they still do that. Um, it used to have some romantic connotation, you know, first kiss under a tree. I don't know, but like the tree has a presence and the tree has a the tree has a story even if we don't know it and being able to you know go through life and encounter you know everyone we meet recognizing they have a story they're not just an object they're not just a utility It might sound really crazy, but um, I've read some stuff about that plants communicate with each other. And I, I totally believe that. Well, I think the earth as a whole is one big organism and every part of it is connected. Um, we just haven't, we just don't understand all the languages of connection. 
Um, but some of us sense that. There's a hand raised up here. <coughs> Yeah, I just wanted to recommend to people, there's a wonderful movie called Fabulous Fungi, which is very much about what we're talking about now. And it, it literally shows the research that's going on about the, um, you know, mushrooms and the, I forget what the word for mushrooms is, the scientific, about how the trees are connected underneath. But then it also goes into what the rabbi referred to earlier about um, different kinds like psilocybin and other drugs from mushrooms that change um, perceptions and are used for um, literally in the health world as well. But I highly recommend the movie. Mm, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Say the name again. Fabulous Fungi. <laughs> it's, it's, I think it's on Netflix, at least it was a month ago. I think so too. I saw it listed there. It did look really interesting. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. So any parting thoughts before we go? I think we've had a wonderful Shavuot conversation. Um, on Shavuot, you're supposed to eat. Anybody know what you're supposed to eat? Things made with milk, these cheese and the like, <coughs> because the Torah is, in Psalms, the Torah is compared to mother's milk. So at the giving of the Torah, we're supposed to eat cheesecake, for example. And um, also it's customary, uh, and we have one happening in our community here in Albuquerque, it's called Leil Tikkun Shavuot. It's an all night study session. I don't think it'll go all night, but it'll go very late. As they say on Shavuot, because the people of Israel were up all night uh, at the moment of revelation, that we should stay up all night and have this conversation. What is the nature of revelation? So we didn't do it all night, but we We've been here for an hour and a half, and I, I think it's been a, a wonderful discussion. Any parting thoughts from anybody? Um, this is Leslie. I, I just have a, a parting <laughs> thought, uh, just a little touch of humor regarding our discussion today. It was something that um, it reminded me of, of what Lily Tomlin, the comedian, once said, and she she commented, why is it when we talk to God, we're said to be praying, but when God talks to us, we're schizophrenic. <laughs> good, good comment. Thank you for that. Any other? A parting wish. It's probably not within the context of these Torah studies, but if you know ways and pathways that can encourage us to have revelation or connection, I, I would be interested. Mm. I have a feeling that I can put something together. I might be able to. I mean, I mean, I mean meditation, right? <laughs> But we might need certain guidance. I've never had a lot of luck with meditation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With singing or chanting, yes, but. I think I've been really fortunate. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I will tell you something we could actually try. And we could, we could do it on Zoom. Um, when I was in Pennsylvania, I was in a group. Um, with an imam, a Catholic priest, an Episcopalian, a Methodist, uh, a Hindu. Um, and we would get together uh, once a month. <coughs> and we would sit together in silence for an hour. 
And then, and people could handle the silence however they wanted to. I used the silence. I got in a very comfortable yoga position on the floor. And I just was silent. It, there was no formal meditation. It was not guided meditation. It was just everyone in their own silence, but a collective silence. And then we would do that for an hour. And then we would discuss the experience for an hour. Now, I don't think, I don't know, an hour is a long, we worked up to an hour in that group over many years, a few years, <clears throat> but we could try an experiment. And we, could, <laughs> we could try 20 minutes of silence. But you gotta understand if you're gonna really do it, <clears throat> you have to turn off your phone. You know, you can't turn off your computer because we'll be on it, but um, we could start 20 minutes of silence. Again, whatever that ends up meaning for each and every one of us. And then we could talk about what 20 minutes of silence was like in the presence of others. I'll be honest, Rob, I, I would enjoy that, but I'd almost need personally smaller increments maybe even starting in five minutes. Mm -hmm. Seriously, because I'd be That's five fine. minutes into it. It's like, oh my God, I got this thing and stuff. That's just me. Because um, You're I'm, right. I'm, You're so right about that. Talking. Yeah, maybe 20 minutes is too ambitious to start. Well, I, I think we could do like an opening, you know, guided meditation, opening up to um, spirit, divine presence. I mean, like... It doesn't have to be anything very difficult. It can be like imagining going up from the roots of a tree, going up to the highest leaf and opening the leaf in our mind to the world, to the spirit world, to divine presence. And then, then having the silence, but having that intention and guidance visually and in prayer and then opening up. I mean, that's how I do it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we could approach it that way. <laughs> we could approach it that way, certainly maybe at the beginning. But the, the idea of undefined silence mm, that's, um, is a different, it's different than that. It, it is. Because, <clears throat> so for example, in our group in Pennsylvania, we had this discussion about, well, maybe every week, every month, a different person could do like a, a setting for mm -hmm. our meditation and event, we very quickly said no to that because people felt like, well, then all of our consciousness is going to be yes. in some respect impacted or diverted with the good, good words, good loving words of one individual. When what we really wanted to talk about was if in the silence, our autonomous silence but being done in the presence of others. And then talking about, like Neil, you talk about, man, after five minutes, I just wanted to climb out of my skin. You know, it's like, I, I couldn't calm my mind down. And you, we would all share those experiences. Um, but then it's also, the conversation can also include, I got through it like that, wanting to crawl out of my skin by thinking about the fact that there were nine of us doing this together. And even though I had no idea what any other than nine people are doing or feeling or thinking in their silence, knowing that it wasn't, I wasn't alone, just that got me over that little hump. And then I could focus for another five minutes. So we could, it might not be bad to start with a little guided meditation, but just remember that if we do that, it will impact the outcome of the silence. And I'm not saying one's right or wrong or better or worse. What do you think? Maybe in music, just a uh, <coughs> intro, you know, opening of, this, you know, that's not silence. No. No, I mean, just to open since, it up. Since you have explored this territory before yeah. and you have kind of be leading us, I would like to 
do it the way that you think could work for us as a starting way. I would be up for mm-hmm. seeing, seeing I, would, I would be up for it. I said, you know, it'll make for good conversation. So what'd you do with the, what'd you do with the rabbi's class last time? Um, we sat in silence for 15 minutes. What? You did what? Yeah, we, we, we all struggled and sat in silence for 15 minutes. And it's I worth a try. I, I would love to be able to, you know, open the door to this kind of an experience. Um, We've been doing it at Har Hashem in Boulder. Yes. And we have a group of about maybe 20 of us that meet regularly for a um, contemplative Shabbat. And, um, but there's a leader, the rabbi leads us in um, some of it's song, but some of it is, is you know, silent um, silence. And sometimes she'll lead us in a, you know, a relaxing of the body kind of thing to get us there. But um, it's, it's been very nice. Mm-hmm. I'm sure mm-hmm. these experiences, I will tell you that um, after doing it for a while, I became dependent on it. Mm-hmm. Jane, did you want to say something? Yes, I'm just trying to be silent. <laughs> now, what I was going to say is I think that I sort of feel like what's been happening through a lot of these things, especially I haven't been to all of the the um, the um, meetings, but um, this one in particular, I think the rabbi tries to bring it out of us anyway, what we're thinking in our own individual silence as we're on a Zoom call. I think sometimes uh, a, an exercise like we're talking about is more effective if you are in a group in person. Um, because I find myself a lot of times just really taking in everything that's said and then when we're done, I find myself in my own silence thinking of all kinds of things or for instance when we start when I came into this I'm not sure how much I missed but um, one of the questions was about our own godly experiences and, and what we've had and I probably spent five or ten minutes at least and maybe I'm even still thinking of things that have happened that if I would have thought about it before I even got on the zoom call I might have had something to to share but some there's so many things in in life that you do think about and sometimes it's difficult to convey it in the short time that we have and and when we're on this this sort of maybe this is artificial intelligence type of meeting i i don't know i just find um i think the idea is really nice but for me, I, um, I could see where the rabbi was talking about how in his group that people were thinking of all kinds of things in that silence. Whereas if we have a guided meditation, then we are all sort of guided towards something. I don't know if I'm getting through. Like the rabbi's first question, what have each of us had? Does anyone want to share their experience of where they had this this spiritual experience or godly experience um, or thing that happened to them that was so brief and um, like share your colors and, and you know that sort of thing that is so different for everyone. And um, I mean, I'm just taking all this in and there's so much to think about that I think when we end this, I probably will be up all night in silence thinking about this (laughs) because we've really touched on a lot of things and I don't know how we bring it. It's just me, I don't know how we bring it into one 
um, or the first 20 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever we decide. I may lose everybody in a second. Looks like my, my battery is trying to give out. But um, I, I don't think I'm making myself clear, but in my mind, I'm trying to convey it in a way that I think there's a lot of, you know, the mindfulness that's that so many people are trying you see so many books now about mindfulness and magazines and practice and mindfulness it sort of sounds like the same thing that we're trying to do that people that people are encouraging others to really feel what's in their surroundings and smell it and hear it and see it or whatever their senses allow them and this could just go in so many directions. But, I mean, it's very interesting. I just, um, it takes me a while to process what we're talking about to the point to where I'm able to express anything. Well, you've, done very, you've done very well. You've done very well expressing yourself. Let me say is something to take away from today's experience <clears throat> is I go right back to Moses and how Moses reacted to the burning bush. He saw something and instead of just sort of walking by, he said, I need to pause and I need to take a closer look. And I think that if like between now and our next gathering, if we could try to do that more consciously, uh, if we go on a daily walk and we walk similar ways, we go for a walk, um, pick out something you usually just walk by and look at it more closely, a flower or a tree or rocks on the ground. It doesn't matter, but it's that notion of pausing. I think I need to take a closer look and doing that. Or like if you plant a garden, and you pay attention to how things are growing from day to day, week to week. Go put your face in the flower or in the plant or in what you're growing and look at it close up, like really close up. And whatever. I think that is one thing we can take away from today. Um, and for next time, <clears throat> we'll, we'll be modest in our ambitions. And, um, but I think we can explore some silence. It's not ideal. You, you, you're right, Jane. It, it needs to be, it would be better in person. <clears throat> and maybe, God willing, we can, maybe we'll be together next Rosh Hashanah and maybe we'll do a 10 minute silence as part of Rosh Hashanah. Who knows? Um, in person. Um, so just hang in there, Jane. You're doing great. Uh, no, I'm hanging in there. <laughs> no, it's been it's it's been wonderful. I mean, really has. It's the reason I haven't said much is because you've given a lot to think about and to ponder. So, wasn't there a Pepsi or a Co Coke commercial that said something like, "Take a pause to refresh." It will help me out here. <laughs> Am yeah. I imagining this commercial? <laughs> I don't remember it, but wouldn't surprise me. I remember the pause. I don't know if it was Pepsi Coke. Maybe it was. Well, I just finished this whole Kabbalah One class, and that was a very, you know, significant recommendation that the teacher there was saying was to pause the whole thing, pause, and so you could be more mindful and not be so reactive and all those things. No Coke needed. <laughs> all right, well, take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. And thank you. Haksamea, thank you so much. Rabbi, thank you. Can I just say something totally unrelated? Sure. Uh, 
it's uh you're coughing a lot and what helps me is this mexican honey mixed with eucalyptus it's called broncolin and you can find it at um some dollar stores, dollar stores and some yeah like lows and stuff sometimes right it's basically honey mixed with eucalyptus it's an herbal, it's an herbal remedy it has something else in it i i always have several bottles at home and it really will help with that cough it's broncolin b-r-o-n-c-o-l-i-n and it's got it's got well it's the honey he should eat and okay. it's um, 